Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about determinants and the inverses of matrices. Consider if we wanted to find x in the equation 5x equals 10. Pretty basic algebra, right? We'd cancel out the 5 by dividing it on both sides. Or equivalently, we could think of this as multiplying by 5 inverse, which is just 1 over 5. right? If we multiply by 1 over 5 on both sides, we cancel out the 5 because the multiplicative inverse to 5 is 1 fifth. That's why it's 5 to the negative 1. What if we wanted to solve for the matrix x in the equation below? We had some matrix A times the matrix x times is equal to the matrix B. We have this matrix equation. So we need to somehow cancel out A to get x alone. It's the same basic idea. We just need to cancel out an entire matrix. So we need to multiply both sides by the inverse to A, right? This means we need to find the inverse to A. If we can find this magical inverse, and then we could multiply both sides. We'd have a inverse ax and a inverse b. Well, the a inverse and the a will cancel each other out, and we'd be left with x equals a inverse b. So we'd be able to solve for that matrix, that unknown matrix x, if we wanted to, in terms of this a inverse and b, if we know what a and b are. It's very similar to 5x equals 10. We multiply by the multiplicative inverse of 5, 5 inverse on both sides, to get what x is. So ax equals b, we multiply by the multiplicative inverse of a, on both sides to get that x alone. Not all matrices are invertible. Consider if we wanted to solve for x in the equation, basic equation once again, 0 times x equals 0. It'd be impossible, right? The information about what x is has just been destroyed by that 0. 0 multiplied by anything is going to come out to be 0, so we don't have any idea what that x is anymore. There's no way to cancel out 0 because 0 inverse does not exist. There are some special things out there that we can't invert. There's no way to flip them to an invert because 0, you can't invert it, right? You can't reverse the process of multiplying by 0. It's gone. The information is lost. It's the same thing going for matrices. Not all matrices can be inverted. A matrix that can be is called invertible. If we can invert a matrix, we call it invertible, or we might call it non-singular. If a matrix cannot be inverted, it's called singular. To be invertible, a matrix must have two properties. The matrix must be square. It has to be a square matrix to invert. And the determinant of the matrix must be non-zero. So what's a determinant? Let's start talking about determinants. The determinant is a real number associated with a square matrix. The determinant of a matrix A is denoted by either dot A, like determinant of A, we're shortening it, or vertical bars on either side of the matrix A. Now, A may look similar to absolute value, but it's not. It's not absolute value. It's the determinant of A. So when it's vertical bars around a matrix, we're talking about determinant, not absolute value. So vertical bars around a matrix, unlike absolute value, can produce any real number, including negative numbers or zero or positive numbers, right? So it's not limited to just spitting out positive or zero like absolute value. It's allowed to spit out anything. So don't get confused by those vertical bars thinking that it implies positiveness. It doesn't. For the most part, though, I prefer this debt A thing, this determinant of a, so that's the form that we'll be seeing, but occasionally you'll see it with vertical bars instead. The determinant of a matrix has many important applications and properties. There's a huge amount of stuff that this determinant is useful for, but we're not going to get into that in this course. In this course, we're only going to conserve or concern ourselves with one thing, whether or not the matrix is invertible and the fact that the determinant tells us that. If a determinant of a matrix is non-zero, so if the determinant is non-zero, then the matrix is invertible and vice versa. So if the determinant of A is not equal to zero, then we know that A is invertible. And if A is invertible, then we know the determinant of A must not be equal to zero. On the flip side, if the determinant of A is equal to zero, then we know that A is not invertible. And if A is not invertible, we know that the determinant of A is equal to zero. So just remember that determinant of A not equal to zero means that it's invertible. And that really works a lot like we're used to with the real numbers, right? You can invert any number you want except zero. It's the same thing with matrices. You can invert any, any matrix you want except for ones that have determinant zero, right? So think in terms of that. Determinant A not zero means invertible. You're allowed to invert. Determinant A equals zero, not allowed to invert. So let's leave the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix. So the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix, so if A equals A, B, C, D, it's given by determinant of A, which is equal to this other way to write determinant of A, comes out to be AD minus BC. A good mnemonic to remember this is to think in terms of diagonals. The down diagonal, so this down diagonal AD multiplied together, 
and then subtracted by the up diagonal, this up diagonal here, CB or BC, so minus BC. We subtract by that up diagonal. So let's look at an example. Let's do an example here. So multiply, if we want to take the determinant of 5, 9, 3, 4. So notice we've got these bars on either side, right? So if we have bars of some matrix inside, what that's saying is take the determinant of that stuff on the inside. So bars on either side, it's just like the bars on either side of the capital letter denoting the matrix says take the determinant of whatever's inside of there. So you will see that notation a lot. But when we're talking about just letters, I prefer that one. Okay, in either case, if we're taking the determinant of the matrix 5, 9, 3, 4, if we're taking, you know, this one right here, determinant of 5, 9, 3, 4, first thing we do is we take the down diagonal, so it's going to be 5 times 4, and then it's going to be minus the up diagonal, 3 times 9, so 9 times 3. 5 times 4 minus 9 times 3, we get 20 minus 27 and that comes out to be negative seven. So once again, the determinant can come out to be any number. It doesn't have to be come out to a positive. It can come out to any real number at all. Minors and cofactors. First, we're going to talk about minors. Before we can look at determinants of larger matrices, we will need two concepts, minors and cofactors. So first, we're going to look at minors. For a square matrix A, the minor, M, I, J, remember I is the row I, J is the column J, of the entry A, I, J is the determinant of the matrix obtained by deleting the ith row and jth column. So we go to this I, J location, this I, A, I, J entry, and we delete out from that vertically and horizontally. So we will take some location and then we will delete out horizontally, delete out vertically, and sort of group back together, see what's left. So for example, if we have A below, we would have M23. So 23 means we are on the second row and we're going to be on the third column. So we're looking at negative eight is sort of the epicenter of where this thing is. So that is the entry a, I, J, so the entry 2, 3 would be negative 8. Now, we delete determinant of the matrix obtained by deleting the ith row and jth column. So we delete this second row. We delete this third column. And we see what's the matrix that's left. Well, the matrix that's left is 6, 2, negative 7, 3. So 6, 2, negative 7, 3, right? That's all that hasn't been crossed out. Now we go and we take the determinant of that, right? We're taking the determinant, so these bars, because the minor is you delete and then you take the determinant. So then we just take 6 times 3 minus negative 7 times 2, 18 plus 14, 18 plus 14, we get 32. So that's our minor. Cofactors. Cofactor is very closely based on the minor. The cofactor just multiplies the minor by 1 or negative 1 based on the location of the entry the minor comes from. So there's this sort of shifting, flipping back and forth pattern of positive, negative that's really deeply connected to matrices and the determinants of matrices. The cofactor Cij, so the ith row, jth column cofactor of the entry Aij, so the entry in the ith row, jth column of our matrix A, is given by Cij is equal to negative 1 to the i plus j times that minor ij. So the negative one to the i plus j is just a way of saying, is it going to be positive? Is it going to be negative, right? Negative one to the zero, positive. Negative one to the one, negative. Negative one to the two, positive. Negative one to the three, negative. Negative one to the four, positive. So negative one to the even number, positive. Negative one to the odd number, negative. So we can see this as an alternating sign pattern, right? If we are in row negative one to the row one plus column one, then that's going to be negative one squared. Negative one squared comes out to be positive one. So there we are at row one, column one. If we were to instead say, look at, I don't know, uh, row two, column three, then we'd be negative one to the two plus three, which is equal to negative one to the fifth. So since it's to an odd number, it's going to be negative. So we get that negative there. So we can see this in terms of the i plus j thing, but we can also see it in terms of this alternating sign pattern. I'd recommend anytime you're working with cofactors, just draw up the alternating sign factor to whatever size you're doing. So for example, if you're working with a 3 by 3, just draw out a 3 by 3 alternating, alternating sign pattern. It always starts with a positive in the top left. So plus minus plus, negative plus negative, 
plus, negative, plus. And then from there, you'll be able to work from it and use that as a reference point. We'll see that in the examples. Thus, based on our previous example, so when we took what m23 was, right, m23 was equal to the determinant of 6, 2, negative 7, 3, because c23 is still going to be based around row 2, column 3, so negative 8, cross out, cross out. So 6, 2, negative 7, 3, same thing here, right? And then we just take the determinant of that, but we're here in the 2, 3 position, so 2, 3 position in our alternating sign pattern, or alternatively want to look at it in terms of negative 1 to the i plus j. Either way would kind of wind up working out the same. So we've got this negative here, so we've got a negative showing up here. So that will wind up coming out to negative 32 because we already figured out that the determinant for that minor is 6, 2, negative 7, 3. That's what we get out of that, right? And so that came out to be positive 32. So when we've got this sign on top of that, that's going to come out to be negative 32. All right, so how do we actually take the determinant? Let's apply this stuff. The determinant of an n by n matrix A is given by the sum of the entries in any row or column. You can choose any row or any column at all, and you multiply each one of those entries by the respective cofactor that would come out of that entry. So the determinant of A, which is equal to, another way to say the determinant of A, is equal to, say we chose the kth row, then we'd have AK1, the first entry in the kth row, times the cofactor of the kth row first entry, plus AK2, the kth row second entry times the cofactor for the kth row second entry up until the kth row nth uh, entry and kth row nth entry cofactor. Similarly, we could have also done this with columns. So it would be the first entry kth column of A times the cofactor for the first entry kth column or the second entry kth column with the cofactor second entry kth column up until the nth entry kth column nth entry k column cofactor. So that's how it works. Don't worry, we'll see an example that'll make this make a lot more sense. Note that this is true for any value of k, as long as 1 is less than or equal to k, which is less than or equal to n. So our k has to be somewhere in these n by n, right? We can't choose a row that is beyond the dimension or a column that is beyond the size of our matrix. That doesn't make sense. But as long as we choose a row that is inside of our matrix or a column that's inside of our matrix, we can choose any one at all. So this process can be done with any row or any column, and you'll wind up getting the exact same result. Kind of amazing. We won't see why, but it's pretty cool. This usually means that it's in our interests to choose the row or column that has the most zeros because it's really easy, you know, zero times a cofactor. We don't have to worry about what the cofactor is. It's just immediately going to eliminate itself. So the thing with the most zeros, the row or column that has the most zeros or the smallest numbers, if we don't have that many zeros, will help make calculation easier. So that's something to stay on the lookout for. All right, determinant of larger matrices, let's actually, you know, put the put rubber to the ground and put rubber to the road and see how this works. So first off, we notice that there's a zero here. I like going horizontally, so let's work out this way. Now notice a three by three sign pattern. Three by three sign pattern, put it inside of vertical lines just so we were reminded that we're doing a determinant, is going to look like this, right? So let's work on this horizontal line. So this one here. So first entry, the first entry in this row is 1. We then go out, we cross out the things on line with that. So that would bring us to 1, the entry, times its cofactor, uh, its sign for that cofactor. So negative 1 times the minor, 2, 3, 3, 5, 2, 3, 3, 5. Next up. It's going to be a plus, plus. Our next one in the row is going to be the zero. We cut out, but we don't even really have to care about the cutting out because zero times whatever we wind up having inside for that minor, that's going to get knocked out. So it doesn't really matter. That's the beauty of choosing the zero. Next, we have the negative eight. So negative eight knocks out what's there, negative eight. And we are on this one. So minus negative eight times the minor that's produced by cutting around that negative 8, cutting a vertical and a horizontal on that negative 8. So 6, 2, negative 7, 3. We work these out. So we've got negative 1 times down diagonal, 2 times 5, minus up diagonal. So 10 minus 9 becomes negative 1. Minus 
plus, so that becomes plus 8 times 6 times 3 becomes 18 minus negative 7 times 2, negative 14. That cancels out. So we've got negative 1, negative, and negative. That becomes positive 1. Oh, whoops, sorry. That did not become negative back here. 2 times 5 is 10, minus 3 times 3 is 9, so we've got 10 minus 9, 1. Sorry about that. So that should have been a 1. Here's a negative 1, so this comes out to be negative 1. Not, does not cancel out. Sorry about that. Then plus 8 times 18 plus 14 becomes 32, so negative 1 plus 8 times 32 is 256, and so we wind up getting 255 as the determinant for this matrix. Alternatively, we could have chosen a different row or a different column. For example, we could have just gone along the top like this, and we would have had 6 times, and it would be positive because if we're going along the top there, so 6 times we cross out around it, 0, negative 8, 3, 5, and then the next one is minus, minus 2 times minor around that 2 here would cross out to be 1, negative 8, negative 7, 5. And then finally, plus, as it's a plus in our signs, 3 times 1, 0, negative 7, 3. So you could work it out that way as well, and you'd wind up getting 255 as well. I liked this row here because we had that 0, and so it just managed to knock itself out right from the beginning. That's that much less calculation for us to have to deal with. I think that's nice. Less calculation makes it easier. All right. There's an alternate method for finding the determinants of a 3x3 three three matrix that some people teach. Personally, I want to recommend against using this method. I don't really think there's a good reason to use it. The method we just did, that method with the cofactor expansion, while it seems a little complex at first, it's, you know, a lot of sort of things going on, it will work for any size matrix at all. And to be honest, this alternate method doesn't actually go any faster, I don't think. So I would say try to stick to the cofactor method. I think it works better in general. It gives you the ability to cancel out a whole bunch of zeros if you see a bunch of zeros. And you can use that same method for any size matrix and work down to smaller things. That said, you might have to know it for class, or you might just really want to use it. So, if you must know it, here it is. First thing you do, you begin by taking the first two columns of the matrix, and you repeat them on the right of the array, right? So we've got 6, 2, 3, 1, 0, negative 8, negative 7, 3, 5. That shows up here, just like normal. But then, we take the first two columns, and then we also repeat this on the right side. So now we've got this sort of large, extra large array of numbers. Once we've got that array of numbers, we can work with it. We multiply each red down diagonal. So we multiply these together and we add them up. So in this case, we'd have 6, zero, six times 0 times 5, 2 times negative 8 times negative 7, and 3 times 1 times 3. That's what we get out of there. And then we subtract by each of the up diagonals those blue ones multiplied together, you subtract by those. So minus, right, it's always going to be minus, and then negative 7 times 0 times 3, and then minus, we're subtracting again, 3 times negative 8 times 6, and then minus, and then 5 times 1 times 2. You work that all out, do a bunch of calculation, you wind up getting the exact same number, 255. So it's an alternate way to find the determinant. It will work if you've got a 3 by 3 matrix. It's not that bad. But I don't really think there's a whole lot of reason to use it. It doesn't really go that much faster. You basically have to deal with the same amount of arithmetic, and it's a very specific trick for something that you might have to do on a larger scale, and you can't use that trick anymore. So I'd recommend using the method we were just talking about with cofactors and minors, but if you really want to use this one, here it is. All right, we're ready to finally see the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. So if we've got some 2 by 2 matrix, A equals A, B, C, D, then the inverse of A, assuming that the determinant of A is not equal to 0, the determinant of A is not equal to 0, I mean, sorry, if the determinant of A is equal to 0, then we can't invert it at all. But if the determinant of A is not equal to 0, then A inverse is equal to 1 over A, D minus B, C times the matrix D, negative B, negative C, A. So notice what we've done there is we've flipped the location of the diagonal here, and then we've put negatives on the B and the C, right? That's what we're getting here and here 
and here and here. So that's one way of looking at what's going on. Equivalently, you could also write this as 1 over the determinant of A because the determinant of A is just AD minus BC. So determinant of A is the exact same thing. And then we're going to wind up having the same matrix here and here. So another way to think about it, remember it might, might be a little easier. For the most part, at this level of this course or any similar math class, you're probably not going to need to compute the inverse of a matrix that's any larger than a 2 by 2. You're almost certainly not going to need to do that by hand. But your teacher might want to. You might just be curious about it. So if for some reason you need to calculate the inverse of a matrix that is larger than a 2 by 2 matrix and you have to do it by hand, we'll go over a method for this after the example. So we'll talk about that after the examples. We'll see something for doing that. There is, notice I said by hand. It turns out if you have a graphing calculator or access to the internet, you can actually just plug in matrices and have other computers invert them for you. It's a very useful thing because the arithmetic of it is very simple but tedious and there's a lot of arithmetic. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next lesson or we'll talk about how there's calculators and matrices interacting together. But you know that's something to think about if you have to take the inverse of a matrix that is really large but you can not do it by hand, you're not required to show all your work by hand, you might want to just use a calculator. So that's something to think about. All right, how do you use inverse matrices? If you have some A and A inverse, then we know that A inverse times A times B equals B, right? A inverse on A, they cancel each other out and they have no net effect. This is because A inverse times A equals the identity matrix, which is equal to A times A inverse. So if you have the inverse to a matrix, you can multiply on the left side or the right side and it will create the identity matrix. So it creates the identity matrix I, which as we noted in the previous lesson has no effect in multiplication, right? So A inverse A up here becomes I and then I times B, well, the identity matrix times anything becomes just what we already had. So we get B. So that's why A inverse and A are canceling out as they turn into the identity matrix and then that just doesn't do anything. I want you to notice we can multiply from the left side or the right side. It doesn't matter. You'll cancel out either direction. So that's one of the nice thing about inverses is they actually will commute unlike pretty much everything else with matrices. It's important to note that if we multiply an equation by a matrix on both sides, we have to choose a direction to multiply from and do the same for both parts of the equation. So if we multiply from the left, we have to multiply from the left on both sides. If we multiply from the right, we have to multiply from the right on both sides. This is because PQ is not equal to QP in general, right? Multiplying on the left by P is generally very different than multiplying on the right by P. So if we're going to keep up equality, we have to do the same action. So we have to multiply from the left on both sides because multiplying from different sides is actually a different action with matrices. So you have to make sure you multiply from the same side if you want to keep the equality of equations. So for example, if we have that A equals B, then we can have CA is equal to CB where we multiply on the left for both sides. Or we could have AC equals BC where we multiply on the right for both sides. But usually, in general, CA is not going to be equal to BC, where we multiply on the left for one and we multiply on the right for the other. It's in general not going to wind up being true, so you will have lost your equality. So make sure you are you notice that sort of stuff. So be careful here. It's dangerous. It's really easy to make this mistake because so often when we think about multiplying numbers in equations, like x equals 10, we might multiply 3x equals 10 times 3, but that's not how it can work in matrices. The only reason we can get away with that in a normal equation is because they commute, so it doesn't matter which side we multiply from. But with matrices, it matters which side we multiply from, so we can't have CA equal to BC. We have to make sure it's either CA equals CB or AC equals BC. We have to make sure we're multiplying both on the left or both on the right. All right, ready for some examples. What is the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix? Negative 2, 1, negative 3, 4, 2, 0, negative 1, 0, 1. So our very first thing that we want to do is we want to make a sign marker just so we can see where all the signs show up. So at this point, we need to choose some row to work with or some column to work with. We could choose the top one. That would be fine. But it doesn't have any zeros in it. It's got some numbers that are larger than that. So I like this one because it's got negative 1, 0, and 1. So one of them is going to cancel out, and the other ones have very little effect on the numbers. So let's work with that. So negative 1 will cancel out those. So we've got negative 1 times 1, negative 3, 2, 0. Then the next one, oh, whoops, yeah, sorry, still that, because 
that corresponds to that sign right there. Next, we have minus, right, because it corresponds to that one, zero times, and we could figure out what this is, but it doesn't matter because it's zero, right? It's going to knock itself out automatically. Zero times anything is going to come out, so we don't even have to worry about computing it. And then finally, the one, so that will knock out these guys. So we've got a plus here, plus one times negative two, one, four, two. We calculate this, so we've got negative one times, one times zero, whoops, one times zero is zero, two times negative three is negative six, but it's minus that, so one times zero, zero, minus two times negative three, so a total of positive six, and then plus one times, so just figure out what this is, negative two times two is negative four, minus four times one, another negative four, so a total of negative eight. We work this out, we've got negative six minus eight, and we get negative 14. Many ways to have done this. We could have also chosen to do this based on this column here. Really quickly, we would have had negative three, since we're starting here, so negative three, so we start off at positive, but it starts at negative three, so negative three times four, two, negative one, zero, minus our next sign, zero times, don't even have to care about it because it'll just knock itself out, plus one times negative two, one, four, two. Or we could have gone from a different other place entirely. We could have also had this, and this would be equal. All of these ways will wind up coming out to be the exact same thing, one of the cool properties of the determinant. <clears throat> so negative two times two, zero, zero, one, minus one times four, zero, negative one, one, plus negative three times four, two, negative one, zero. So many different ways to do this. This, this here is the same as this here is the same as this here. They all wind up being equal to negative 14. So the question of how we want to approach this, which row, which column, we just choose whichever one seems easiest to us. And even if we wind up choosing the wrong one, we choose one that's slightly harder, it doesn't matter because they all come out to be the same thing. We might have to do a few more extra arithmetic steps, but in the end, we'll still get the same answer, so it's okay. You don't have to really worry about that. All right, what is this one? So we've got a four by four. So at this point, we have to take the determinant of this. First thing we wanna do, we wanna get a nice sign grid so we can see all of our pluses and minus. So plus, minus, plus, always a positive in the top left. Minus, plus, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, plus. Great. So at this point, we wanna figure out which is our best row or column to choose. I see two zeros on this column. So to me, that looks like it's going to make it easiest. So I'm going to go with that one. So I have the two crosses out these. That corresponds to this positive one here. So I just have two times. I cross out those other ones. I'm left with negative one, three, zero, negative four, five, four, one, one, zero. Okay. And the zero here and the zero here, don't even have to worry about them because they're just going to multiply out to cancel out entirely. So we only get to having to worry about the three. That leaves us to here. So it's minus three times what gets crossed out. Three times two, negative one, three, zero, negative four, five, negative three, one, one. Okay, so at this point, let's figure out of these new ones, which ones do we want to use? Let's make a new smaller three by three sign grid so we can think in terms of that now. Okay, so this one, what seems easiest is this column to me, and I'd say this row here. So we'll work with those. So we've got two times whatever the determinant of that large, larger three by three is, this one right here. So we're working with the zero. So the zero, that's gonna just knock out. The only one that we really have to care about is this four. So it will be four times, oh wait, four here is there. So we've got eight negative four. We always have to pay attention to that cofactor bringing either a plus or a negative. That's why we make these sine grids here and here. So we have to pay attention to cofactors. Negative four times, so that would cross out these things. So negative four times negative one three, one, one. And then over here, 
minus three. So we chose this one. So we're going to have this row starting here. So minus three times negative zero. Don't have to worry about that one. Plus, so it'll be plus negative four times. It crosses out the other ones that it's uh, horizontal and vertical on. Two, three, negative three, one is what's left there. And then minus five, it crosses out and we get two, negative one, negative three, one. All right, we start working these out. Since they're two by two matrices, we can just work them out now. So we've got two times negative four times negative one times one is negative one minus one times three is negative four. Then minus three times negative four times two times one, two minus negative three times three. So two minus negative nine gets plus 11. two minus three times three. So we've got, yeah, negative nine. So two times, negative four times 11 minus five times two times one is two minus three, negative one. So two here and then minus three, negative three times negative one becomes positive three, but we're subtracting by that. So it's two minus one two minus three, so we get negative one. Okay, so keep working that out. Two times negative four times negative four is going to come out to be two times positive 16. Minus three, negative four times 11 is negative 44. These cancel out, we get plus five. 2 times 16 is 32 minus 3, negative 44 plus 5 is negative 39. So these negatives cancel out. At this point, we've got this equal to 32 plus 3 times 39 is going to be the same as 3 times 40 minus 3, so plus 117. 32 plus 117 comes out to be 149. So the determinant of our matrix is equal to 149. Great. So by carefully choosing which row we decide to work with, we can make this a whole lot easier, right? By choosing that third row down, we were able to get a zero to show here and a zero to show here, which may allow us to cancel out all the things. So we only had to figure out two three by three determinants, which is a lot easier than having to figure out four of them or more, you know, anything like that. So by carefully choosing the row or column that you do your cofactor expansion on, you can make things a lot easier on yourself. Third example, prove that for any two by two matrix A, where the determinant of A is not equal to zero, then A inverse equals one over AD minus BC times the matrix D negative B negative CA. So one thing that should be written here is A is going to be equal to our standard form for just writing a general one is A, B, C, D. So how would we prove this? Well, we just prove it by showing that A times this supposed A inverse does indeed come out to be the identity matrix, because that's what it means to be the inverse, that something times its inverse comes out to be the identity matrix. Some matrix times its inverse, uh, inverse matrix comes out to be the identity matrix. That's what it means to be an inverse for matrices. So let's just check that. So let's say A inverse times A. So we don't know for sure that it actually is going to turn out to be the inverse, but Let's go with it. We were told the determinant of A is not equal to zero, so it's in the determinant of A. Well, remember, the determinant of A, if this is our A right here, then that's going to be equal to A, D minus B, C. Because this would be our only worry in creating this A inverse. One over A, D minus B, C. If it's dividing by zero, everything blows up. But since we were told the determinant of A is equal to A, B, D, B, C, and we were told it's not equal to zero, we know that we don't have to worry about dividing by zero, so we can move on. So A inverse times A. So we've got one over a D minus B C times the matrix D negative B negative C A. And then times A is A B C D. So first we work through with matrix multiplication, work through with matrix multiplication. We've got, sorry, our one over A D minus B C will scale later. Right now it'll be easier to just work with just the variables without that fraction getting in the way. 
So first column, we know we'll get out to a two by two matrix in the end. So first row times first column. D times A, all right, so let's expand this even more. So D times A minus B times C. Great. Next one, D times B minus B times D. Okay. Second row on first column now, negative C, A on A, C. Negative C on A gets us negative C, A. A on C gets us plus A, C. And the last one, negative C, A on B, D gets us negative C, B plus A, D. So we see this. And we do a little bit of simplification, moving things around. Well, db minus bd, since they're just real numbers, d and b are just numbers, so they are commutative. So db minus bd, they just cancel each other out. They knock each other out. Negative ca plus ac, once again, they knock each other out. We can rearrange things a little bit. So we have 1 over ad minus bc times the matrix. Well, da minus bc is the same thing as ad minus bc. And this was 0, and this is 0. And negative CB plus AD, well, we can write that as AD minus BC. So 1 over AD minus BC times this, well, we'll get 1, 0, 0, 1, which is exactly what we were looking for. So this is indeed equal to the identity matrix. And if we were to do it the other way, A times A inverse, to multiply our inverse from the right side, it would wind up coming out the same thing. We'd get the same answer. It turns out that if you find the matrix, find an inverse that works on one side, you know that it has to work on the other side, but that's a little bit of a deeper result we haven't talked about explicitly. But you could prove this just by hand if you wanted to show A, A inverse, but that's pretty good. Final example, given that B equals negative 2, 3, 0, 4, and AB equals negative 6, 29, 4, 22, find the matrix A. So how are we going to do this, right? We don't know what A is. We know what AB is. We know what B is. Well, notice we can create a game plan like this. AB equals AB kind of obvious, but it's true, right? So if we came along, we could knock out that B with B inverse. So we could have AB equals AB, and then we'd come along and we'd hit with B inverse on both sides. And now we could rewrite this as A equals, well, we could cancel that to A on the right side, but we could also see there's just AB times B inverse hey, we know AB. We know B, and so if there is a B inverse, we can figure out what it is from our B. So our first step is figure out what B inverse is. And then once we know what B inverse is, we just have AB times B inverse, and we'll have our A. So that's our theoretical understanding. Now it's time to just do the arithmetic. So if B equals negative 2, 3, 0, 4, then B inverse equals 1 over the determinant, which is AD minus BC. So negative 2 times 4 minus 0 times 3. So that's negative 8 times. We flip the location of the main diagonal, and then we put negatives on the other ones, negative 3 and negative 0. We can write as just 0. Simplify that just a little bit to negative 1 8th times 4, negative 3, 0, negative 2. Great. So at this point, we know from what we showed here that A is equal to AB times B inverse. Well, we know AB is negative 6, 29, 4, 22, and B inverse is negative 1 8th, so times negative 1 8th, 4, negative 3, 0, negative 2. So I think it's easier to bring the fraction in afterwards. So let's pull the fraction to the front, right? The fraction there is just a scalar, so it's just going to scale the matrix. So we can scale the matrix anytime we want. Let's just pull it out to the front so we can have our matrices do their multiplication. So we've got negative 6, 29, 4, 22, 4, negative 3, 0, negative 2. Okay. So still that fraction up at the front, negative 1 8 times whatever comes out of this. So it'll come out to be a 2 by 2. Negative 6, 29 times 4, 0. Negative 6 times 4 gets us negative 24. 29 times 0 is just 0. 
negative 6, 29 on negative 3, negative 2. Negative 6 times negative 3 gets us positive 18. 29 times negative 2 gets us negative 58. So that gets us a positive 40. Oh, sorry, not positive. 29 times negative 2 got us negative 58. So it's a negative 40. Sorry about that. 422 on 4, 0. 4 times 4 gets us 16. And 22 times 0, just 0. 422 on negative 3, negative 2. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. 22 times negative 2 is negative 44. Negative 12 minus 44 comes out to be negative 56. So at this point, we can use our negative 1 8. We simplify this out. We uh, you get negative 1 8 times negative 24 will become 24 divided by 8 is 3. Negatives cancel out, so we get positive 3. Negative 1 8 times negative 40 becomes positive 5. Negative 1 8 times 16 becomes negative 2. Negative 1 8 times negative 56 becomes positive 7. So we've got A equals 3, 5, negative 2, 7, and there we are. We had to do a lot of arithmetic to get to this point, so let's double check and make sure that that is the answer. We know that A times B has to be this guy right here because we were given AB right from the beginning. So let's take a look. What would A times B be? Well, we know what the AB we just figured out is. That's 3, 5, negative 2, 7. And the B we started off with that we were given is negative 2, 3, 0, 4. So we work this out. The 3, 5 on negative 2, 0, that's going to get us a 6. 3, 5 on 3, 4, oh, I'm sorry, not 6, but negative 6. 3, 5 on 3, 4 is going to get us 9 plus 20, so 29. Negative 2, 7 on negative 2, 0 is going to get us negative 2 times negative 2, positive 4. And negative 2, 7 on 3, 4, negative 2 times 3 gets us negative 6. 7 times 4 gets us 28. Add those together, you get 22. And so that is exactly the AB that we started with. So it checks out our answer is good. Great. All right. So that completes his understanding of determinants and inverses. We've got a great understanding of how that works right now. So uh, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye. However, if you want to check out the, um, the stuff for if we want to be able to do expanded, sorry, we want to do inverses for larger than 2 by 2, larger than the, just that simple formula, let's take a look at it. Let's look at that. So finding the inverse of larger matrices. For the method we're about to discuss, we will need some techniques we haven't learned just yet. In the first part of the next lesson, we discuss augmented matrices, row operations, and Gauss-Jordan elimination. You'll need to be familiar with these things before uh, what we're about to talk about will totally make sense. So if you haven't already seen these things, go check them out first and then come back and watch this part. It's just the first half of the next lesson. They're actually probably like the first third. The method we're about to go over is applicable for finding the inverse of any n by n matrix. If the matrix has no inverse, if it's singular, this method will wind up failing. It's normally easier to first check that there is going to be an inverse before trying to put all this work into it. So just check to make sure that there is an inverse by getting the determinant, because getting the determinant will actually take way less time than working through this method. So it's a good idea to check the determinant first to make sure that what you're doing will actually manage to work out. All right, so let's see how to do this. For an n by n matrix A, you begin by creating an augmented matrix with the identity matrix I n. So if we have some A that is 1, 3, negative 2, negative 4, then we leave that part the same, and we drop in an identity matrix. Since this is a 2 by 2, this winds up being a 2 by 2 identity matrix right here. So we've got 1, 3, 1, 0, negative 2, negative 4, 0, 1, right? So we've got it split in this middle where the left side is A, the right side is the identity matrix. Okay. Next step, you start applying the method of Gauss-Jordan elimination. You use row operations to reduce A, that left side, to the, in, to the identity matrix. The result of the augmented matrix, once you manage to finally get this to be the identity matrix, what you'll have on the right side will be the inverse. You'll have A inverse on the right side. So for example, if we have 1, 3, negative 2, negative 4, our first step, we want to turn this into a zero, right? We're doing Gauss-Jordan. So row two, we take our row two and we add two times row one. So two times one gets us plus two, that cancels to zero. Two times three gets us plus six on negative four, that goes to two. Two times one on zero gets us two. Two times zero on one, same as it was before. So we've got our new matrix here. We continue with this method. We had 1, 3, 1, 0, 0, 2, 2, 1 on the previous slide. So at this point, we want to turn this into a 1. So we multiply that entire row by 1 half. So this becomes 1. 2 times 1 half becomes 1. 1 times 1 half becomes 1 half. At this point, we now want to get rid of 
this, we return this into a zero to continue with gauss jordan elimination. So we subtract, we've got a one here already, so we subtract three of row two, so minus three times this, so one times negative three on three gets us zero, and also zero times negative three gets us one, we don't have any effect there. Minus three here gets us negative two, and minus three on one half gets us negative three halves. So at this point, We've got an identity matrix here, right? This is just an identity matrix because it's ones on the main diagonal, zeros everywhere else. So what we've got over here on the right side is our inverse matrix A. So that's our inverse matrix A. We just bring it down, turn that into a matrix, and we've got our answer. Finally, you want to check your work. It's really easy to make a mistake in all that arithmetic. We were doing the simplest possible at two by two. If you have to do this by hand, you're going to have to be at least doing three by three or larger. So it's really easy to wind up making a mistake in all that arithmetic. So make sure to do notations of what your row operations were, what we saw on the left there, what we talked about in the next lesson when we explain this stuff. And also at the end, once you get to the very end, check your answer. Make sure that A inverse times A is equal to the identity matrix, or A times A inverse is equal to the identity matrix. So for example, we started with A equals this, and we figured out that A inverse should equal this, so we check our work. We multiply the two matrices together. So, 1, 3 times negative 2, 1. Well, 1 times negative 2 plus 3 times 1, negative 2 plus 3, that comes out to be 1. 1, 3 on negative 3, 2, that gets us negative 3, 2 plus uh, 3, 2, so that comes out to be 0, they cancel out. Next, negative 2, negative 4 on negative 2, 1, so negative 2 times negative 2, 4, minus 4 times 1, 4 minus 4, uh, that comes out to be 0, and then negative 2, negative 4 on negative 3, 2, 3 over 2 times 1 half, so negative 2 times negative 3 halves gets us negative, sorry, positive 6 halves, minus 4 halves, so we get one out of that. Ultimately, it all checks out. We figured out that this is indeed the inverse. It does wind up working out just fine. So you, it's a really good idea to check your work at this point because it's easy to make a mistake when you're doing that much arithmetic. So if you have to do this stuff by hand, always check your work at the end because it's going to be a small amount of time compared to the massive amount of time you've spent doing this. And it'd be a real shame if it wound up not being true. All right, so hope that gives you a pretty good sense of how, to, how all this inverse and determinant stuff works, and we'll see you in the next lesson when we finally get to see an application of just how powerful matrices are. Why we've been interested in them is because they do allow us to do all sorts of really amazing things that make stuff way easier than it would be um, from what we're used to so far. So pretty cool stuff. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.